Yeah, my first boss said ever, if we go to another country or you do a lecture there, you should try and find out famous people from Poland. And when I actually worked there, I was a Polish guy, and we always would say to him, okay, so who's famous from Poland? So he came up with Copernicus. And Copernicus is pretty good, because what a lot of the work we're going to be doing and showing today is actually shows the relationship, obviously, between the sun and the person in the building. And the next person is Madame Curie. Um, and you're going to say, what does that happen to make to with, with buildings? Well, when we start talking about radiation, cold radiation, heat radiation, we then have a marriage between two famous Polish people, which is Madame Curie and, and, and Copernicus. My Polish uh, friends here reminded me that there was a, a third famous Polish person, which is Chopin, but my friend said Boniak was much more important than, than Chopin. Most of you here are too young, don't even know who Boniak is, but something to learn about. Um, um, one thing I have to comment on is that I see these, these photos over there, yeah? If I was at this university, I would never dare fail an exam, otherwise I'd have to face these guys. Okay, so I have worked in the Netherlands. This is the um, Netherlands Embassy in Warsaw. I think it's been running now for about 10 years. Uh, Dutch architect, uh, radiant ceiling, radiant floors, lots of glass. And also a uh, slaughter Tarasi in, in Warsaw, which everybody understands. Uh, so this was uh, one of the projects as, as well that I worked on here. And everybody always uh, relates to the glass roof on Slaughter Tarasi, but what people forget actually is the buildings behind were some of the first in Europe with the re-emergence of active beams. Um, in 1993, with ASHRAE, I read a paper as well on uh, 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 active beams on energy uh, <coughs> usage. I was based in the Netherlands at the time. So <coughs> from 1993, basically, until we believe in January this year, ASHRAE has stood still and done nothing regarding the, the, the advancement of, of active beams within uh, air conditioning systems. <coughs> and, and one of the things, much like Piotr here, is after we finished doing designs and doing many uh, investigations into how the applications of work would be, then we write papers so it can be passed on to academic figures as well. Um, going back to basics again, so we've, we've looked at, so we, under, we've, we understand Copernicus and we've looked at Madame Curie, what radiation is going to be. So here's some of the basics which actually come from uh, Fanger. Uh, and Fanger actually derived the angle factor. The angle factors actually were derived before that, uh, but, but Fanger sort of put them together in a package when he published his work in 1971. So most of the applications, when we look at angle factors, uh, and if you actually have to do them manually, uh, normally you associate with a rectilinear shoebox type of space. So when we get to specific buildings such as this, this is the uh, Akron Art Museum in Akron, Ohio. Uh, this is just one part of the crystal which came from Co-op Himmelblau. It actually consists of 147 surfaces. And with today's modern computer programs, most of the computer pro programs are certainly more intelligent than the humans that actually operate the, the, the computer programs. So what we then have to do is then slow the computers down so we can actually compute the radiation heat exchange from each surface to another surface. And why is this important? Well, we don't just condition a space based upon a set of temperature constraints either between 20 degrees Celsius to 24 degrees Celsius. We have human beings in buildings, and what we un want to understand is, is how comfortable a human being will be. So how will the mean radiant temperature as well as humidity and airspeed affect the comfort conditions of a, of a, of a human? Uh, there are two diagrams now on the screen. The one on the, on the bottom left shows a typical wireframe, which is actually generated from structural engineering, where the structural engineer will have nodes and hang the nodes in space and show what the relationship of each different node will be to uh, the, the other nodes. And the top right one, you'll see the wireframe again, but you'll see yellow. The yellow actually is a sun path across the floor into other surfaces. So what we also do is when the sun path hits another surface, we then recalculate what the surface temperature of that surface is going to be based upon its absorption of solar radiation. One thing I'm allowed to do by being a very poor uh, mechanical engineer is turn the, the, the actual diagram around. So what we're seeing now, it's turned slightly as opposed to the other. So the scale on the right-hand side is our PMV. So if you, everybody is, is familiar with the PMV, it should be between plus 0.5 to minus 0.5. But also, um, there are no architects here. So when we explain to architects, this is very much like your traffic light. Green is good, red is bad. So here you can see a big red area, which is bad, which we can go back to the architect and explain we have to do something with the glass or with the conditioning system to remove this uh, uncomfortable area. 
So with many iterations of looking at the conditioning system, looking at the glass, looking at the type of glass, we can then get a constant uh, 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 equal comfort level throughout the floor. And so this is the finished um, product, the one we look at here. And if you look very carefully, you won't be able to see an air conditioning system. So the idea when you go to the art museum is you're to look at art or an exhibition. You're not there to look at sheet metal work and, and diffusers and a mess like this on the ceiling. So what you can think about while we do the rest of the lecture is how do you think this space is conditioned? The conditions in Akron are not unlike um, where we are in Poland here. It's, it's very cold. It gets down to about minus 12, minus 14 degrees during the winter, and it gets up to some of the reason, about 30, 31 degrees during the summer. So it's something to think about how we condition that space. So now we're going to jump inside the museum, and we're going to start looking in the galleries. And one of the main things we, we start to look at is when you go to a gallery, you look at the artwork, you look at the ex exhibition, you don't look of how it's going to be conditioned. And here you can see on the right-hand side, you'll see a slot around the perimeter. And this is the slot of where the displacement area is, is displaced into the gallery. Yeah. Uh, you'll see in an, a later project of where we had a variation of this. So the idea being is uh, people lose 70% of their body heat through their head. Uh, people then create a, a vertical plume of their own ventilation. So if you then provide the air across the floor, it will self-ventilate where the people are going to be within the space. Uh, the rest of the space condition is taken care of with a radiant floor for both heating and cooling. Um, this is a project we've been up and running now for two, two, three years. It's Cooper Union in New York. <coughs> um, it was the first building of its type. Uh, it's it's 20,000 square meters with 6,000 square meters of laboratory for a university much like this university. Um, what happened with the building is uh, it was the first that had a radiant ceiling for heating and cooling and operable windows in New York, which uh, the Americans thought was a big no-no that you cannot do it. So, so we, we can do a whole day lecture on Cooper Union with all, all many um, facets of what it, what it had. So here we've got two pictures of the building. So what we decided to do, what you see on the outside, it, it, there's an outside skin, which is a perforated skin, so it's a, it's a climate facade. Now, what we do is on the right-hand side, you'll see there are panels which can be opened. And the idea of opening the panels is that you can let natural, more natural daylight into the space, or you can actually let solar radiation in to heat the space. So each space is individually controlled, and what, it, what happens through the building management system is it continually runs to see which would require the least amount of energy, whether you open the panel to allow natural daylight in, and that means you can dim the lighting or close the lighting down, or if there's too much heat coming in with that solar radiation that you're consuming too much energy, then it will close and, and reduce the, the amount of cooling required in the space. And so and on the, on the le left hand side, you can see there that during either very, very harsh winter or through the high summer, then much the same as you would either put your coat on during the winter to protect the building. The building closes up to keep the heat within the building. And at the same time, it closes up during the summer to keep the heat outside of the building. So here, as, as mechanical engineers, and I'm assuming everyone's a mechanical engineer or want to be a mechanical engineer, here we've helped the architect design and run their building. So we haven't even talked about a conditioning system. What we've then done is, is use building physics to actually make the, the, the living skin work for this building. So again, uh, we uh, provided uh, the, the well, there was no information there from the, from the perforated skin, the perforated steel which we used on the outside of the building. So went with another professor from Colorado State, and we derived uh, a mathematical model to, to actually quantify what the shading coefficient was going to be of the different perforations. And then two weeks later, I found a German company which had a catalog of all the shading coefficients for all different types of perforations and meshes. Uh, this is um, another university building. This is just east of, of Los Angeles, uh, Claremont McKenna College. The architect is Raphael Vinoli. Uh, here, this was just uh, going to be a, a, a high-performance a high, high building. As you see, lots of glass. And so we had a challenge on our hand for this building. Uh, so here you can see we had uh, there were active beams in most of the uh, spaces. Um, and the... If you see at the bottom left, you'll see those windows there. They are the op operable windows for the natural ventilation in this space. And here is one of the meeting rooms, or, or, or general meeting rooms, gathering rooms for people. 
Uh, this one had a radiant ceiling, had a VAV system for it. But as you can see, uh, we're allowed to have floor-to-floor -floor, uh, 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 glazing, whereas typical American code only allows 40% of the facade to be glazed. Uh, this building was 48% lower than code. Um, the previous one I forgot to say, which was Cooper Union. Cooper Union was, I think, about 38%, something like that. So you can show that we can really get a lot lower than the, the, the base code uh, that, is, that, is, that we have to uh, uh, compare ourselves against or compete against. These are typical control systems which we have for radiant systems. Um, if you see on the right-hand side, we have uh, uh, operable windows. So there's a contact there, so if the window opens, then it closes the system down because you don't want to have a counteractive system where you're trying to heat and cool the space with the windows open. Uh, and then we have the same for an active beam system. Uh, on the left, you'll see a little group of controls, which is occupancy sensors, light dimmers, etc. all to each individual control to conserve energy within the space. And I know that uh, Piotr, in his talk, will go much further of the quantification for, for energy and energy quantification, especially what's applicable here in Poland or Europe at present. So now we're going to go to somewhere different. Uh, we move things around. So this, is, uh, this was an original design. This is Bangkok Air Airport. <coughs> Actually, the design is way back in 1994 when I first went to the USA. Anybody been to Bangkok Airport yet? Not really. No? We should go tomorrow, yeah. Well, um, the total area is 550,000 square meters. So from the, from the diagram there, from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, that's just under two kilometers if you want to walk from one of the concourse to the other concourse. So our, our challenge was when you look at the, at if you look at the Bangkok climate, one of the funny things we had with the architect, so I'm making fun of architects, is if you go back again, what Copernicus didn't do is actually say, who was it, Galileo, found out that the Earth was leaning. So the Earth leans at 22 and a half degrees. <coughs> Bangkok is at 14 and a half degrees. So what actually happens here is, even though it's in the northern hemisphere, the sun actually shines from the north when it's its most intense. So here we see a section through the concourse. The concourse is 22 meters high. What we're trying to do then is only condition the portion of air where people are, which is the first two meters. So um, let's go back. So ag again, here we've got uh, the interaction of the typical types of glass. We had fritted glass on there. Uh, we had different types of frit. We had the angular factor. So again, uh, looking at the, the dependence of the angle to the people in the space. And, and then we started to play with physics. So if we're all aware of Stefan Boltzmann, which is you know, the, uh, the heat emission from one surface to another surface. So on the top left, if we look at the top left there, there was no radiant floor and there was no low uh, emissivity on the surface of the ceiling. So the PPD was 70%, which obviously was, was not an ideal state. And on the top right, we then put a low emissivity coating on the inside of the glass the radiant, the, the, there's no radiant floor, so the floor temperature is still very high because of the solar absorption, the solar radiation on the floor. And on the bottom left, what we then was no low E coating, but we put a radiant floor in, so the floor temperature was 23 degrees. And the final one is the bottom right, where we had a low E surface on, on, the, on the glass, and the floor surface temperature at 23 degrees. And then what we can actually do is you can actually re-radiate the radiant cooling from the floor back down to the space, and we get a PPD of 10%. And here is one of the many CFDs that we, we, which we've carried out, which shows a very clear line of the thermocline within the space. And if we go back to basic heat load calculations or heat loss calculations, if you look at the red area, so the red area actually means that the temperatures there during the, during the summer are the same temperature, if not higher, than the external temperatures. So when that's applied to two-thirds of the area of the total roof, that the inside temperature is the same temperature as the outside temperature, then we know from the first law of thermodynamics that there is no heat exchange either from in to out or out to in. Other typical airports, such as uh, uh, Hong Kong Airport, they have a temperature of 24 degrees, so if the outside temperature is 34 degrees, then you have a, a, a massive convective load over your airport at, at any one time 
just through the, the temperature differential between outside and inside. So again, we've let physics engineer the architect for us. Now we're going to advance to uh, two years ago. Uh, this is Korea. This is Incheon Airport Terminal 2. This one is 680,000 square meters. So here we had another challenge with a, a roof, which had to be a very, very light structure. And if you look where we're looking now, that is the going to be the equivalent of five or six football fields next to each other all the way through. This is going to be the uh, departures level. So again, we use the same principle which we used, which was uh, displacement ventilation from below the decks, special displacement ventilation across the floor, radiant heating and cooling, because Korea has a very high heating load as opposed to, to Bangkok, but we put it there. So if you, if you look at the roof there, the span of the roof, those um, girders, they were six meters. So the depth of that roof was six meters. So much the same theory as Cooper Union also using the theory of Bangkok is if we could control the temperature within that roof void, that roof opening, then we could also start to reduce the heat loss and heat gain to the space. So here you see some of the, uh, the, the, the architects or the actually the structural engineers wanted a very, very light structure. <coughs> so this was the challenge. There could be no heavy girders, no heavy, uh, heavy, heavy structural beams. So then we started to look at physics again. We started looking at what would the inside surface temperature, what we, what we were trying to do then. Could we control the inside surface temperature of this construction <coughs> by varying the airflow and where the air came through, through the cavity? So again, very similar to Bangkok, which was a radiant floor displacement ventilation. So then what we would do is in between the cavity in the roof, we would take at certain times during the summer, we would leak in the top left, we would leak air from the space into the cavity. So then what had happened is that the cavity then would uh, uh, not absorb any more heat from the outside. It would be a buffer. It would, it would stop that solar radiation and the heat load coming into the space. And then on the top right-hand side, at certain times of the year, we would just take outside air, which would be lower than either the inside air or the cavity air, and run that through there. What we also found is that it would reduce the surface temperature so we'd also get radiation cooling from the whole roof area into the space. And the bottom right, one summer, one winter, I always get them the wrong way around, but then what we would do is, when the, uh, during the winter, what we could do is put excess temperature into the cavity so it would leak from the cavity to the space and not from the space to the exterior. And this is what we call a breathing skin for the whole roof area of the, of the airport. Very briefly, if we look on the... On the left-hand side, because Piotr is going to talk much more about energy conservation, but compared to a conventional airport, our design reduced the uh, energy by 65%. Uh, that was a total of, uh, as it says there, 22,750 tons a year. And then you see on the right, we, we had 35,000 megawatt hours of renewables, such as BP. We, we had uh, turbines, uh, uh, floor plate, pressure plate also balance it up for a nearly net zero. So we can do it on big jobs as well as little jobs. This is what John introduced, uh, this ASHRAE Reva Passive Beam Design Guide. Um, there was a Reva Design Guide which was um, somewhat out of date. Uh, and also for the poor Americans, it had to be made less technical so they could understand it. So. It's due to be published in 2015 for both active and passive beams. Um, one of the things, uh, wi which engineer doesn't like making a spreadsheet? You know, other computer simulation, we make a spreadsheet, we can do everything with a spreadsheet. So, so here we, made, we tried to make a very simple spreadsheet for the calculations. So here we had one for, for, for Riva, for, for the international with the European uh, norm. And then we had the ASHRAE, and then what we found out when we looked, there were very, very different uh, ventilation requirements from what the code was going to be. Um, this, this was only one of the small details, because most of the ventilation we do are tested to see how much latent heat removal we need by the ventilation air. We'll come to that in a minute. So um, one of the main points that we were looking at, and one of the big problems, 
The big problems Americans can't understand is because they don't know how to calculate latent load in the space and how to humidify or dehumidify a space. So we, we have to speak very slow and be very clear so they can understand this. So basically, we've taken uh, data either from the for, from Mollier diagram or psychometric diagram and, and plotted it out on, onto a, a spreadsheet. And it's up to the, any engineer, any user, what data they want to put in there because it doesn't do it automatically, but it's up to the individual to select what temperatures they want to run in the space. And here we look at the one where, where actually the DP is the supply of the supply air going in at 13 degrees, which is usually 12 degrees off coil, which gives us a basis of grams per kilogram for how much uh, absorption we can make from the space. So again, basis data from, uh, typically we use the uh, ASHRAE weather data, which is, which is static data, put that data in there for what space we're going to be. These illustrations here are for Lisbon. Then it calculates how much air is required for ventilation, just how much per, per person, either through the ASHRAE or for the uh, uh, European uh, norm. Then it calculates how much air is, air is required for dehumidification or moisture control, whichever way you want to name this. And the most important number is a very small number there at the bottom of the column there, is where it says 69%. And it comes, comes here, what we're saying is our recommendation are, is, is for an active beam that you should be doing 60% or higher cooling from the coil of the beam and only 40% or less from the air system. There are some selections which we've seen of where people actually go to 60% or 70% of the cooling is done by air. Then basically you're just purchasing a very expensive VAV system because your beam isn't working that much. Some of the recent work we've been doing is when we're looking at comparing active beams and radiant ceilings compared to a VAV. The actual energy reduction is, in, is, is between 20 to 30 percent lower than a VAV with active beams and radiant ceilings when, when they are, are correctly designed. This is the way the total sheet looks and these are if, if you actually look along the top or you can see the top, they're for different spaces, meeting rooms, uh, classrooms. And again, if you look at the bottom, you can actually make your own judgment as to what the application, whether it's going to be suitable or non-suitable. But it's up to the individual as, as how they want to use this. Now we're going to jump to uh, Beijing in China very briefly. Uh, this, was, uh, this is a bank, 40,000 square meter, uh, double facade. And what we're going to look on now is not too much because Piotr is going to go to this in more depth, is these are the type of numbers that we put there right up front in the schematic design from the first days of working on the project we tell what the en what the energy is going to be so here we have a typical expression of carbon dioxide of emission um, i've also said yesterday and i say it quite a lot is anybody that talks green or talks sustainable is 10 years too late we don't do that anymore if you look at the number of points you get on lead or Briam for energy, uh, then you see that that is the driver for what happens, for how efficient the building is going to be. So what we're moving on to now is the EUI, the energy use index of a building. And actually what Piotr will, will show you, but he didn't realize it, the fact is that a lot of the expressions he uses are in a kilowatt per square meter per annum, which is the European. It's actually there, the information is there. So what we've got to do is bring this information to the, to the, to the front. So the idea being is from the start of a project when we get involved, we develop an energy, energy use index and all the way through the project, all the project team can test and see how the project is developing or, or how high performance the building is going to be. So now we're going to go to Paris. Uh, this is the, the, the latest building uh, I worked on. It opened on October the 27th. Um, because this is being recorded, I'm not supposed to tell you what the costs are because they're not being released. But the, c the costs are in, in excess of 500 million euro for 9,000 square meters of building. So you have to forget that number, yeah. So, so um, a lot of the modeling we've done was using Katia, which comes is Frank Geary building, so you come from Katia. And then what you can do is you can float with all different parts. So the idea actually from the building, as you can see from here, it's got these external shades, 
right? The, 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 the shells, the cows, the, the, the wings, call them what you will. So the building inside is actually sheltered from the, from the solar radiation. So converting Katia into Rhino, we came up with several scenarios of where actually there would be solar radiation penetration between the, the covers of the building. So as you can see, it's uh, quite a picturesque building. So now we're going to take a look inside the building, because as I say, uh, when we were looking at Akron, this is the space, uh, this is the form. Uh, I believe it's like 24 meters high. Um, we'll see some sections in a minute. See the seating, the seating can be adjusted into different angles of rakes. The seating can also be brought completely horizontal and flipped over so then it forms a complete four. So that could go from any number of small people for a lecture, say 50 people, 360 people are seated or 500 people as a, 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 um, a cocktail reception or something. So looking at the, uh, at, the, at, the, at the small roof in there, where from the ceiling we were going to do displacement ventilation, then the question came, well, what about the velocity for people that were at the top of the rake, which would be nearer the ventilation, and what about people at the bottom? So we had to evaluate what the velocity would be. And then, of course, we were dealing with the French, who understood nothing about high-performance buildings, and so it had to be a fan coil or nothing. So... So here we have the, the 50, the 360, and the 500 people. One of the diagrams of where we'll be actually uh, flowing with a the, with the, with the blanket displacement ventilation down. Uh, and if any of you have any knowledge of CFD, then you know that the results are dependent upon on how accurate the boundary conditions are for a CFD analysis. So here is, is, is a very simple diagram with all the different areas and the different temperatures which were developed by um, many simulation programs. And here are some of the many results I will go through quite quickly because it just gives you an idea. So here we can see the air streams down to the lower levels. And then we had many sections into the rakes to investigate what the temperature was going to be, especially the temperature from the lower levels to the higher levels. And then it was obviously air, uh, air velocity looking for, for, for possible draft within the space. Now this is a floor plan, and if you look at the colors very carefully, this is a PMV floor plan to see where the, the comfort are. And as you can see between the two middle lines on the left-hand side, all the areas are within the comfort range. Then we will go to one of the galleries. And again, from the galleries, uh, I showed you before on Akron that we're doing displacement ventilation from the perimeter. Here you see also a perimeter slot. But when we presented the horizontal displacement ventilation, the curator said she didn't want a, a, a horizontal slot there, vert a vertical slot, she wanted a horizontal slot in the floor. So we said immediately it won't, wouldn't work. Uh, we were tested, so then we decided to go and model this, which is the vertical air coming out from the wall. Again, we set up all the parameters with a, with a, for a CFD study of looking at all the different surface temperatures and the radiation from lights and radiation from people. And then we can see some of the many temperature differences. You see here the very dark blue is where the air comes into the space. You can also see it disperses very quickly, so there's, there is quite a good very, a temperature mixing across the floor. Here we, here we see some of the airflow streams, so you can see the air comes out vertically it uses, loses its kinetic energy, then it rolls over on itself and then will pour across the floor. One thing to look at on this diagram, you'll see a line which goes to the corner. That is a line which is 1 meter 50 from the floor, and that is the lowest height that art will be hung. Anything above 150 is where the art will be hung on the walls. So, although the space is being conditioned again by radiant floor for heat and cooling, ventilation rate had to be increased if we were to put 500 people in there, which was the design load. So as soon as we put 500 people in there, we had to increase the velocity of air. As you can see, the air does exactly the same performance, except it starts folding over after about two meters, which crosses the one meter 50 line, and immediately the curator saw this. She said, no, it's going to be too cold for the artwork. And as the first photograph showed there, we went back to, the, as we told them traditionally, with a horizontal flow from the vertical slot around the perimeter. Here's some of the other spaces. We move on to other other spaces around the world. I think I've got finished. I've got uh, this is Pearl River Tower in Guangzhou in China. 
This is for SOM. Uh, we've done all the energy studies. This actually worked out to be about 40% lower than China Energy Code. The goal was 30%. We got it down to 40, 43%. 49% when the climate windows were working. Now this is mixed use, very similar to Zlota Tarasi with all the buildings around it. This is in, uh, in uh, uh, Shanghai. Now this is one of the many towers I'm working on. This is a fairly small one. This is 300 meters. A lot of the towers we're working on these days are 600 meters or 600 meters above. And so most of us are aware in, in climate engineering of looking at data from around, around Europe, around Poland, looking at different places so we know what the temperature is going to be in solar radiation. But how many of you thought about how that changes vertically when you start going up a building, when you go 200 meters, 400 meters, 600 meters, you've got a whole different set of climatic data. And gradually we've been publishing some of this data to help us get away, uh, find out how the building's gonna perform. For instance, in Moscow, which is minus 27 for design temperature at low level at 10 meters height, when you get up 500 meters, you're at minus 40. So how do you design your heating or your cooling condition over the height of the building for all those different temperatures? These are some of the uh, net zero ads on we put onto some of the buildings, which most you probably know. Uh, photovoltaics, I think we've got turbines, but the main objective is actually to reduce the whole energy consumption within the building uh, just to get to net zero. Thank you very much.